let me go through something that's uh, a bit extracurricular, uh, but I think it'll help um, explain some of the things that I think I am don't quite fully uh, explain, um, that I'd <laughs> like to explain a little bit more fully. Um, one of them that I think I'm realizing as I'm going through this session is the, the natural connection between uncertainty in momentum and uncertainty in position. And um, that is best uh, illustrated with this simulation. So the connection there, it's quite mathematical connection. So um, that's why I don't want to dwell on it too much. Um, it's a mathematical process called the Fourier analysis that it gives the explanation of this. Um, so, so just the quick description of Fourier analysis. It's a way of way of representing any arbitrary. Um, arbitrary repeating function uh, in terms of component of a sinusoidal oscillating function. So, uh, so here, you know, I have a, a sine function that I'm trying to illustrate and yeah, okay, it can be illustrated by a sine function. And uh, if you imagine adding multiple sine functions, um, so, you know, each of these are sinusoidal of a different frequency, what we call harmonic, um, then um, you get some shape here that, that uh, so this is the, when, what you get when you add all this together and you're beginning to see a shape that, uh, that looks quite different from just regular sinusoidal. And, um, and this kind of Fourier decomposition can be used to actually um, analyze any kind of arbitrary function. So this simulation has some presets like uh, what, what if you have a triangular wave, then a triangular wave can be expressed as this one sine function that already kind of matches the triangular shape. And to develop this sharp corner, you add these, so nothing here, but okay, this one, you see that highlighted yellow, nothing here, but okay. So these higher harmonics are actually quite small. So let me show you something where you will see greater influence of those higher harmonics. I think let me try a square. So a square wave involves this a sharp transition or what's attempted as the sharp transition. So in order to get this a sharp transition, you have to add these significant parts of the higher harmonic. And the sharpness of this transition is limited by the highest frequency that's included here in the limit where this goes to infinity, I can approximate square wave to the arbitrary precision. Um, wonder what it says on the wave packet. Oh, I think that's the fun one. Um, does that, well, okay. Um, I mean, it, uh, I, I don't know how much I like this. You know, I don't like this too much. So, um, so let me show you that connection between uncertainty in momentum and in uncertain position. I think there's one thing that you can see here is that um, with all these things you are adding up here, the wave, the total wave that you see here, it's what you might call localized. It's localized within this space here. You have negligible uh, amplitudes out here. And, and there's a reason. Um, the way these waves are added, you see that within this region, all these different waves, they add constructively, where one wave is increasing. All the other waves are kind of increasing as well. So you see this constructive sum here. Now, as you go, and the same on here, and as you go farther out, you kind of look, see this more random looking thing. And that's where all these different components add destructively. That's why you see more or less a flat line here. And in this, uh, I think a discrete to continuous tab is where you can really see how in an attempt to, to um, in an attempt to, to localize a particle, localize the wave packet, 
you must introduce uncertainty in wavelength. Um, so, so let me show you here. So here, this is some preset thing, and this is my wave packet. And the ways that this up, uh, they have it repeating, it repeats every whatever this interval shown. Um, uh, but you can just pretend that we are focusing on this one portion here. So there, the simulation has two parameters that lets me control how the wave packet appears. It gives me this wave packet with parameter. It has width in terms of position. Oh, that's so small, but that's what this sigma x is. <laughs> It has this width in terms of what they call K or wave number. Um, you can think of it as an inverse of the wavelength. Well, there's two pi there, that's why it's in radians per meter, but this per meter portion tells you that it's uh, inversely proportional to the wavelength. So, um, so right now this packet here, it has a large width in terms of this K value, the wave number, inverse of wavelength value. So let's say, all right, uh, let me, I want more precise uh, uh, wave number. So let me make this width uh, smaller. So as I make this width smaller, I hope you notice something. So up here, this graph, um, so compared to where I had a larger width, this uh, narrower width graph has a fewer values of um, wave components. So this is the carrier wave or the center frequency. And these side bends are what allows you to modulate your amplitude of the wave. And as I make the packet width in terms of wave number narrower, resulting in more precise wavelengths, you see that my wave packet is more and more spread out. In fact, in the limit where my wave is very well defined in terms of wavelength, there's only one way that such a well-defined wavelength can correspond to um, uh, the waveform in, in space. It has to be all in all space because it's basically one sine function that's spread all over. So by decreasing the uncertainty in wave number or uncertainty in wavelength, I've had to increase the uncertainty in position. And all of this is, by the way, just a classical mechanical, classical wave theory. Uh, if we are willing to deal with all the mathematics of it, then I, we can do that. Just, you know, Fourier analysis, it's all math. The quantum mechanical piece comes in when you associate the wavelength or this wave number to the momentum, the de Broglie relationship, the, the uh, Planck's constant is equal to momentum divided by wavelength, or the, wait, wait, Planck's, wait, sorry, I, I don't know how to say this out loud, so let me write it out. The de Broglie relationship, which relates um, momentum to wavelength, I guess, let me put it that way, or wavelength to momentum. I think this is the version that's in your textbook. Momentum is given by Planck's constant divided by wavelength. This uh, relates the wavelength, which is what the simulation is dealing with, to momentum, which is a particle property. So, so through this relationship, any uncertainty in wavelength becomes uncertainty in momentum. And that's where the natural connection between, that's where you get to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that um, this is the natural connection between the uncertainty in position and uncertainty in wavelength. And through this relationship, uncertainty in wavelength becomes uncertainty in momentum. So, um, so this idea is quite a bit mathematical, which is why um, I didn't want to talk about it too much, but uh, you can at least play with the simulation and look at different things and uh, look at pretty pictures. <laughs> uh, let me just show you one more simulation to kind of wrap this up. Oh, I don't have a lot of time. So this is the simulation that I linked in the announcement. And I just wanted to show you a representation of quantum state. This, uh, uh, this is the uh, kind of what representation of quantum state looks like. Um, 
uh, let's see, what can I say here that's not um, super mathematical? Well, I think I can show you some aspects of this, um, which is, so quantum tunneling, I don't think we are really covering it all that much. So let me skip that part. Um, I think one thing I can show you is, so I think this line here, that's the average energy. So the, the yeah, and the average energy and uh, the distance between this line and this uh, uh, potential energy represents the, the kinetic energy. So um, the larger the distance here, means the larger kinetic energy the particle would have. And larger kinetic energy means larger momentum. And you can kind of see it here, how larger momentum means a shorter wavelength and smaller momentum means uh, you can't really see much of a wavelength because it's just one bump. So uh, let me actually do this. Uh, I'm gonna make the width of my wave packet larger. When I do that, you see this. So with a larger width of wave packet, you see that, okay, now I actually have enough space to actually illustrate that wavelength, the thing I was referring to. Uh, you see how curved this is doesn't really change with the width. All that the width changes is, hey, with this much curving, do I have enough space to show the oscillation? And I want you to see this. This green bar, um, the whole smearing of the bar, it represents the uncertainty in the energy of the particle. And uh, you see that the, the less certain we are about the position of the particle, the more certain we become of its momentum and hence its kinetic energy. So, so that's one that you can kind of see here. And yeah, this particle is moving across super slow because I set it up so that it has a very small kinetic energy. Um, yeah. So, so that's one. And, um, and you can see this uncertainty momentum aspect through this part of the simulation. You see how as this wide bump moves across, Nothing really changes. It's a wide bump that's moving across. Um, now, when I return this to the, uh, not all settings, when I return this to the width that it was around, then you will see something change a little bit. So with this more highly localized particle, watch what happens as it moves across. You see it spreading out. And there's a reason for that. It spreads out because uh, here it's simulating an electron. So it's a particle with a mass. And um, so it's a momentum is related to its velocity by mass times velocity, that's the momentum. So when it had this well-defined uh, within position, it had a rather significant uncertainty in momentum as represented by the spread in energy. So this uncertainty in momentum means uncertainty in velocity. And uncertainty in velocity means that um, certain parts of this wave, in some sense, parts, quote unquote, moves faster and some parts move slower. And that different speeds of different parts of the particle makes it spread out. And finally, um, you can see an extreme version of that if I make a quantum measurement. And so this is the part where I guess I probably shouldn't get into because it's the aspect of quantum mechanics that's frankly confusing to a lot of people. And I don't have enough time either in this session or in the class as a whole to spend enough time with it to actually give it a proper um, treatment to what the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics says. I'll just say this part. Um, so all this that you've seen so far is uh, all deterministic. It's all uh, uh, reversible, deterministic time evolution of quantum state. What makes quantum mechanics so challenging uh, conceptually, philosophically, is that uh, when you make measurements, there have to be a what's called stochastic collapse of wave function. 
as in this wave function here, it represents all different possible places the particle can be. Now, when you make an actual measurement of particle position, it'll, uh, you measure the particle to be at one position. You don't see it all spread out if with a single particle. So this is what the simulation simulate. When you make a quantum measurement, the particle simulate to you uh, detecting the particle at a single point, really limited by just the precision of your whatever instrument you are using. Now, when you detect a particle this way, you have highly localized the particle. And that detection process has to involve imparting large uh, momentum uncertainty. This collapsed wave function, it has such large uncertainty momentum that when I let the time flow, some part of the particle is actually moving the other way from its original direction. Um, so, so yeah, and and that um, stochastic, um, it's a, stochastic means uh, random. So it's really random. That's what the simulation simulates. When I make a quantum measurement, it randomly with some chances that propor that's proportional to this um, shows a particle here. But when I reset and remake the measurement, I'm not guaranteed to find the particle in the same spot. The only thing that the theory tells me is that I have a significant chance of finding the particle somewhere in this range. I have close to 0% chance of finding the particle way out here. So, um, so yeah, that's all I wanted to demonstrate. And, um, I, and it, it, uh, uh, I think this is a good place to leave our discussion of quantum mechanics because um, I, I don't want to leave you with sense of feeling that not all of this makes perfect sense, which is perfectly fine, particularly for in modern physics. Um, at the same time, I don't just to, you know, want to tell you that, oh, nothing is known. We don't know, like, that's not the case. We do understand quite a bit of quantum mechanics. It's just that it involves quite a bit of unintuitive concepts.